good evening to everyone around the world. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. Okay, let's begin. After 32 months, almost three years, we have come to the end of our personal journey together through the Lotus Sutra. Like any end, uh, you get to the finish line and it's joyful, but at the same time, bittersweet, uh, that something has come to an end and a new beginning is, is in front of us. So uh, I've really wanted to first say thank you to Reverend McCormick for um, allowing me this opportunity to challenge myself uh, to dive deeper into the Lotus Sutra and find meaning. And thank you to all of you who have been so patient, kind, and generous in your time and letting me proceed through this, uh, both sharing my thoughts and also making abundant mistakes as we go forward. And you've never held me to uh, that. I thank you guys so much for that. So we are going to be jumping into the last part of the threefold Lotus Sutra, which many consider the conclusion to the Lotus Sutra itself, the Sutra on the method for contemplating Bodhisattva universal virtue. And as we always do, um, we like to start with reciting in English um, a passage from the Sutra itself. And I would hope that you would feel comfortable joining me as we do this. So please enjoy. Delusions nor sinking in the sea of illusion. Contemplate the mind and you will see that it is no mind. Merely arises from distorted thoughts. Mind with such attributes arises from illusion. Just like the wind blows through the sky, no foothold in empty space. Herently such attributes of things are neither produced nor extinguished. Is an offense and what is a virtue since our minds are themselves emptiness. Fences and virtues have no host, so is it also with all things. Do not abide or perish, performing acknowledgement and remorse. In this manner you will observe that the mind is not a mind and see that among all things is no thing that abides all things are themselves liberation are themselves the truth of extinguishment and they are themselves tranquility <clears throat> called great acknowledgement and remorse it is called greatly adorned in acknowledgement and remorse is called acknowledgement and remorse free from the attributes of wrongs is called the destruction of mental consciousness those who practice acknowledgement and remorse become pure in mind and do not become stuck on things like flowing water in every thought and every moment they will be able to see the bodhisattva universal sage and the buddhas in the ten setting the scene. This sutra picks up directly from chapter 28. Ananda, Kashyapa, and Maitreya begin by asking the Buddha to teach how to practice the great vehicle that was elucidated in the rest of the Lotus Sutra. Then all the practitioners in the Sangha, all the beings, all the heavenly bodies, all the monks, nuns, lay people, all together join in and also make the same request. The Buddha then teaches the entire Sangha how to practice the great vehicle. 
So from a standpoint of this great cosmic play, we all here today, all of us on this Zoom call are present, listening to the Buddha instruct us. And as we talk about the major themes that we're going to focus on today, reminding ourselves, as we talked about last month, that Bodhisattva Samantabhadra, Bodhisattva Universal Sage, arose in the east as in the sun rises, which symbolizes a beginning and equated analogously that practice is the beginning and the sun sets where Shakyamuni Buddha was ending in the awakening. Again, the sun rises from the east, a new day, a new beginning, a new life, a new breath and beginner's mind. And repeating what we also talked about last month, Bodhisattva virtue, Bodhisattva universal sage. Um, Michael, can you watch the, um, the mute console? Um, I think some other folks are not on mute. We're getting a little bit of background noise. Bodhisattva universal virtue is a role model for us, a behavior role model. And perhaps that is why he is not speaking because he's really not a being that's present, perhaps. Samantra Bhadra is not just some abstract figure, though. He, they, she are here all around us in flesh and blood. In our sanghas, there are bodhisattvas who work tirelessly to help others, to bring relief from suffering, whether you organize a retreat, cook for the sangha, or drive someone to the airport, or provide a donation. You're acting as the arm of the Buddha, an arm of bodhisattva universal virtue. And Bodhisattva Samantabhadra represents the practice of Shamatha and Vipassana. And there's a line in the Sutra that says, listen attentively and deeply ponder and reflect. This sentence exactly expresses Shamatha calming, listening attentively with focus, and then Vipassana deeply pondering and reflecting. I also want to emphasize that Nietzsche and Buddhism is a devotional form of Buddhism. We see in the Lotus Sutra both self power and other power. And as Grand Master Chen Tai encouraged us, single mindedly chanting the name of the Buddha with repentance and humility. This is where we start. By we begin by attentively listening and deeply pondering ourselves. How can we change our karma? purify ourselves and realize awakening. This is the question that the three great bodhisattvas and the entire Sangha ask the Buddha, how can we change our karma? So this is where we start. We begin by observing ourselves as we are with all of our imperfections and perfections and not trying to eliminate them or change them, but holding them and being aware of them. This is Bono Soko Bodhi. And then this idea of how do we bridge this gap between the ideal and the actual. And we read frequently of these incredible beings and the Buddha himself. And we ask ourselves, there is a gap between who we are and how we see ourselves today and what this ideal picture is. And sometimes this gap feels insurmountable. I wanna call you back to what we talked about in chapter four, chapter faith and understanding the parable of the wealthy man and the poor son. The poor son didn't realize that his inheritance was all of the vast riches and treasures, metaphorically of the Buddha land, that he was unworthy. So his self-perception led him to feel like all he was good for was shoveling manure from the stables until his practice brought him to the point where he could clearly see, oh my goodness, I am a child of the Buddha. One of the things about the Nichiren Bay Area Sangha is that because we come from San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge is this world renowned landmark. This sutra and our Sangha is a bridge for all of us to move from where we perceive ourselves as this imperfect being that we too are Buddhas becoming Buddhas. And Buddha does promise us that we will heal, transform and awakening through this practice of repentance which is self power, meaning we take responsibility for our actions and humility, which is meaning that not there's another higher power that's going to intervene externally on us, but that we are simply 
and magnificently a part of the greater whole. And it is his trust and confidence in the greater whole that the Buddha promises us that we will heal and transform. And we will receive benefit from our practice in the form of actual proof. This is a long sutra and a great deal of the sutra involves a practice called dream work, which is using our dreams to somehow let our subconscious come out and see what's going on. I want to stress that dream work, uh, a valid practice requires working directly under the supervision of a teacher uh, who is trained in this. And this idea of dream work is completely beyond the scope of this presentation. So unless you are working with a teacher trained in dream work or a professional therapist who is trained in interpreting and understanding dreams, again, today, we aren't going to be talking about that. We begin as we are. Bono Soko Bodai. Our defilements lead to awakening. And this is a quote from the sutra itself. How, without cutting off our delusions and renouncing our five desires, can we also purify our sense faculties and completely eliminate the accumulated karma of our wrongs? With only the pure ordinary eyes that we receive at birth from our parents, and without forsaking our five desires, how can we see things unaffected by their impediments? So this is the huge question that begins this entire sutra. How do we do that? There's this gap between the Buddha who's enlightened and us who live in this mundane world. We can't see that far ahead of us. So I want to stress early on that awakening takes effort. It takes practice. It takes hard work and it takes great patience. So please be patient with yourself and please be kind to yourself. And knowing when you look back that you will see that you came a long way, not unlike this 33 month journey that we took together. When I began this, uh, I had no idea. And I had been practicing for 45 years, just the depth and the magnificence and the wonder that was contained in Lotus Sutra because I had skipped over it for so many times. And at, now looking back, I was like, oh my goodness, this really is amazing. And I have changed and I have grown and I have deepened my practice and I have seen actual proof in my life going through this process. And there's a wonderful quote from Robert Frost that says, the afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. So again, when you begin, be kind to yourself and be patient with yourself and just move forward trusting and confident that the Buddha, this process flow nature of the universe, this other power will in fact work and take us to places that we never dreamed of before. So how do we do this? Well, the sutra tells us exactly how to do it. Through our posture, mental and physical posture, that we knelt with palms placed together, attentively gazing at the Tathagata, never turning our eyes away. When we're in front of the Gohonzon and we're looking at Namu Myo Ho Ren Kyo, our eyes resting lightly, focused and yet unfocused, as we just let our entire being rest upon the Dharma, the Myo Ho Ren Kyo, which is our raft, which is our solace, which is our sacred sanctuary, and just absorb the sound and the feeling of that in Shamatha and Vipassana. So practice, it begins with, again, lines from the sutra itself. You must earn, you must be earnest and never give up. So today, along with this idea of being patient and kind and loving with yourself, that it will happen. There is a great exhortation that the only way to attain awakening and to change your karma is you have to practice. And if you're not practicing, it's not going to change. So please, Practice hard. As Tian Tai said, single mindedly and wholeheartedly chanting Namu Myoho Renge Kyo with joy, humility, and repentance, deeply trusting and confident in Myoho Renge Kyo as if your life depends on it. Knowing that all the Buddha's practices, and now Nichiren picks up, knowing that all the Buddha's practices and virtues and merits are contained in Myoho Renge Kyo, when we chant this, we naturally receive the seeds of our own Buddha nature that will grow up into the sky, just like the ceremony in the air, out of the muddy pond, into a beautiful 
lotus flower. And as Nietzsche wrote in rebuking slander of the law, praying as earnestly as though to produce fire from damp wood or to produce water from parched ground. In the sutra, you must now be diligent and never lazy in your practice. Now the Buddha is not browbeating us and trying to make us feel guilty if we're not, but he's just reinforcing that the greatest things in life take the greatest effort and that you have to apply yourself to move forward. If people want to accomplish supreme perfect awakening, so the Buddha now is responding to the question, how can we change our karma, which everybody's asking. And the Buddha says, okay, listen, I'm going to tell you right now. If people want to accomplish supreme perfect awakening quickly and in their present lifetimes, sudden awakening, see the Buddhas and the 10 directions and the Bodhisattva universal sage, then they should purify themselves by bathing, putting on clean garments, burning fine incense, making offerings, and go to a secluded and deserted place, the Kaidan, the place of awakening, your home altar. There they should recite the great vehicle sutras and ponder the meaning of the great vehicle, Shamatha Vipassana. Having made this earnest request, the practitioner should bow to the Buddhas in the ten directions and practice the method of acknowledgement and remorse. They should read and recite the sutras of the great vehicle. They should ponder the meaning of the great vehicle and bear in mind the work of the great vehicle. They should revere and pay homage to those who keep the great vehicle, and they should look upon all people as though they were Buddhas and living beings after they were their parents. Doesn't this remind you of chapter 20 from the Bodhisattva Never Disparaging? There's been several key themes that have continually worked themselves throughout the entire Sangha. Bodhisattva Never Disparaging, Skillful means, the eternal life of the Tathagata, Bono Soko Bodai, Yui Butsu Yo Butsu, and so on. Some very key themes. Also, I want to call attention that uh, uh, several times in this sutra on the method of contemplation at Bodhisattva Universal Sage, the Buddha talks about attaining the Dharani of rotation, which really could mean simply to rotation means repetition. So if you attain the Dharani of repetition, you have built a new habit pattern. And the Buddha tells us how to do this. And remarkably, it's similar to how modern self-help and psychology tells us that if you want to make something a habit, you have to do it regularly and assiduously for 21 days, as the Buddha refers to in the Sutra, three times seven days. After 21 days, if you have been consistent, earnest, diligent, never lazy, and never giving up after 21 days, you will have attained the Dharani of rotation, meaning you will have a new habit pattern that will stand you in good stead as you go forward. Okay, now we get into what I think could in fact be the most challenging aspect of this entire sutra. We're going to talk about repentance. And for those of us who grew up in the Christian church, or especially in the Catholic Church, this term is super fraught with peril. And it means a lot of different things. And so if nothing else today, I want to really get us all clear and get rid of that old thinking of what repentance is and bring in a new life and meaning. So repentance, as the Buddha talked about before, and we, we recited to each other, this acknowledgement and remorse, repentance, is critical to the practice. As this sutra makes clear, our practice is spending time here and now in the moment, calmly reflecting and contemplating true reality, what it is and what it's not. And I hope this presentation will free you from the pernicious meaning of sin and repentance that we grew up with in the world, particularly if we came out of some of the more fundamentalist and uh, dogmatic uh, religions. Repentance is a terribly misunderstood word for because most of the religious connotations it has taken on this idea that we think of repentance as some guilt imbued feeling that we are not good enough, that we are bad, that we've done something wrong, and that we have slighted God or offended some superior being, fill in the being of your choice, and that we're all going to go to hell. Merriam-Webster's quote uh, definition of 
this idea of sin is on offense against a religious or moral law and a transgression of the law of God. The cultural pendulum in 2023 has sung, swung so far to the other side that it rejects these stultifying ideas of moral guilt that now all ideas of remorse and shame and accountability are scorned as qualities of the weak. And thank you, Donald Trump, who wasn't the cause of this, but has become the greatest sign and symptom that one can be morally completely corrupt and still become president of the United States. Not even 20 years ago, someone who had been accused of having affairs would have recused themselves and suspended their campaign. But today, it's okay. And goodness knows we should never actually impose strict rules and a sense of shame and accountability within our children. The idea of millennial snowflakes comes to mind. You know, everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets a ribbon and everybody's a winner no matter what they do. But repentance in the true sense is not guilt, nor is it self-recrimination, nor is it or should it be self-pity. The ancient Greeks, so I want to say sin, first of all, let's get rid of that and let's think about a different word, transgression. And the ancient Greeks used the word metanoia, which meant turning away, meaning a spiritual metamorphosis, a transformative change of heart. And this is an excellent way to look at this idea of repentance as a transgression, meaning a misdeed. Um, let's look at the definition from Reverend McCormick's forthcoming Nichiren Shu Buddhist Dictionary. The Sanskrit word is papa. The Sanskrit word papa can also be translated as offense or sin. It could be sin, but again, I'd like to avoid that because of the connotations that it's taken on, particularly here in the West. It could be misdeed. It's the opposite of merit. So perhaps I'd like to offer you all this alternative way of thinking of sin, transgression, misdeed, and repentance. Consider it instead reflection. The reflection of Vipassana from Shamatha Vipassana, an acknowledgement and a remorse for our past actions and more importantly, false views, which we're going to get into in the next slide. So remorse is also translated as misdeed, worry, regret, repentance. It indicates a state of emotional turmoil aroused by reflections upon past actions that may not necessarily lead to a real resolve to do any better. You're just guilt tripping yourself, as they say, and can even interfere with more positive actions because you feel like you feel bad and you feel like you're not worthy. Again, the poor son who thinks the only thing they're good for is shoveling manure. So it interferes with more positive outlooks and more positive actions and attempts to cultivate the mind. Restlessness and remorse together are the fourth of the five hindrances, which get in the way of our clear practice. Remorse is considered wholesome when it is remorse for the commission of an unwholesome action or for the omission of a wholesome action. It is considered unwholesome when it is remorse for the commission of a wholesome action or the omission of an unwholesome action. So we find here that the way Buddhists think of remorse is it's indeterminate, meaning it can be either good or bad, depending on the context. So it's either wholesome if you are regretting doing something not good or unwholesome if you're regretting that you did something good. So it really requires this analysis in your mind. Remorse can be either helpful or unhelpful. And remorse needs to be about the right thing and not clung to either. This sutra is teaching us that remorse is critical characteristic of practice. Now, for me personally, I think the greatest transgression one can ever do is to deny or thwart your own or someone else's Buddha nature. We go back to Bodhisattva, never disparaging. See how they really are. See, again, that there's these themes that weave themselves throughout the sutra. Now, let's look at karma. Some consider karma determines everything in the present, leaving no room for free will, that everything is predetermined by our past actions or our own fault. But really, karma really means action, and action can be either thoughts, words, or deeds. 
and karma is directly determined by one's intention. So if one's intention is good or one's intention and bad determines the severity of the karma. Karma itself, action, thoughts, words, and deeds, again, indeterminate, like remorse, meaning it could be good, bad, or neither. You idea of the fundamental breakdown Buddhism into a soundbite. Buddhism is to do good, do no harm, and seek awakening for ourselves and others. Now, this, uh, da, 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 da. okay. There's five different kinds of karma. And we talked about how some people think karma determines everything in the present. This mistaken idea undercuts any need to feel responsible for our actions or their consequences, remorse, repentance. It also leads to victim blaming and that every bad thing that happens to somebody must be the result of their past actions. You see a homeless person, oh, it's their fault. Someone gets cancer, oh, it's your fault. Oh, you're, you know, you. you you're mentally ill. Oh, you must have done something to somebody in the, bat in the last lifetime and it's your fault. Unfortunately, many people, even some Buddhists, believe that this is what the Buddha taught. However, this is completely untrue. The Buddha's general theory of dependent origination is as follows. When this exists, that comes to be. When the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. This means that all things come to be only do causes and conditions, cause and effect, and have no inherent existence in and of themselves. These causes and conditions operate according to these five different modes of natural law, of which what most consider as karma is only one of the five. And all five interact with each other in order to bring about life as we experience it. The Buddhist monk Nagapriya in his book, Exploring Karma and Rebirth, which I highly recommend, and it is on our website, uh, the link to the Amazon book, classifies karma based on the sutras that there are five modes. One is physical or inorganic, two is biological, three is non-volitional, four is ethical, and five is spiritual. The physical inorganic embraces natural laws such as those of physics and chemistry. For example, seeking an explanation for the occurrence of an earthquake, like we just saw, terrifically horrible in Turkey and Syria, we're better served to think about the theory of plate tectonics than by the theory of karma that those poor people in Syria or in Turkey did something in a past lifetime that resulted in their house falling upon their head and killing them. So that's just nonsense. So it's better to think of plate tectonics physical and inorganic. The biological number two governs the physical organic order, including the laws of biology. For example, if I catch a cold, it would seem more sensible to explain this by supporting the presence of a virus rather than I did something morally wrong <laughs> to catch a cold. The non-volitional number three governs the law of the mind and to some extent relates to psychology as we think of it today. For example, the phenomena of shock or post-traumatic stress or even mental illness. The ethical mode, now this is what people traditionally think of as karma, governs the sphere of volitional human conduct and is looking at this slide again, thoughts, words, and deeds. What is our intention behind them? That's only one of that. The spiritual mode in conclusion of the five could be thought of as a process by which we transcend greed hatred and ignorance, and achieve generosity, compassion, and understanding. It could also be seen as the compassionate influence that other another person exists in our life. The impact of the Bodhisattva Universal Sage on us and the world. The Bodhisattva Universal Sage does not act toward others in accordance with their karma, but deals compassionately with everyone regardless of their karma. That's, so they're doing it to us because their love and mercy and compassion is so strong. It's not our karma that created that. It coming from the outside. Other power. The five modes analysis of experience shows that karma is just one karma, the fourth volitional, is just one application of dependent origination. Therefore, many circumstances and outcomes are likely to be governed by conditions only very indirectly related to one's karma itself. But we should beware of seeing these different orders of conditionality as completely discrete. 
Every experience comprises a vast network of causes and conditions, which we can't see. Our previous moral conduct will often have a bearing on our present experience, certainly, but in many situations, non-moral factors may well exert a more decisive influence. The teaching of the five modes thus presents a more complex and subtle account of why things happen as they do than a crude egocentric view of karma that everything that happens to me is my fault. We need to remember that the actions of other people may be more decisive in any given situation than our own karmic stream. It may be their evil or their goodness that causes us to suffer or benefit rather than our own. So hopefully we now have a better understanding of karma and how repentance is not guilt, but is reflection. Uh, Reverend McCormick, I see the chat has a lot of things in there. Have you already dealt with the answers um, or should we pause for a moment? Yeah, let's let's pause for a moment. Um, let's see. Uh, Stephen is wondering what this has to do with lessening karmic retribution. Um, I think we should maybe save that for a little further down. And um, I guess uh, John Martyr was asking, Nitran seemed to attribute all natural disasters to lack of faith in Lotus Sutra, not perhaps physical conditions. Um, I'll just address that real quickly. Um, that actually I can address both of those real quick. <laughs> um, Nietzsche does emphasize the karmic aspect of natural disasters and wars and other things. Um, and, and as Mark said, these these five types of causality uh, do interrelate. And of course, Nietzsche was a medieval person, <laughs> so he did not know about plate tectonics and things. So he, he was liable to attribute more things to karma than we would. Um, however, when he wrote letters to, um, I'm not sure if it was uh, Toki Jonan or, or one of the, or Soya Nudo, one of his other followers, uh, he does acknowledge this teaching that there are other types of causality going on than just the karmic. Mm -hmm. And he does this in reference to uh, Tiantai's writings. So, you know, Nietzsche definitely recognized this, this particular teaching of the five kinds of causality, though he doesn't refer to it exactly by that name. Um, also, to clarify this point, it's, it's five kinds of, um, Mark's been saying the word modes, which is good. Uh, this, the Pali word is niyama, which means a certainty, like things are certain to operate in this way or in this mode. So there's these five kinds of certainties about causality. So you could shorten that to say five kinds of causality. And then karma, as Mark has been saying, is, is the fourth one, the intentional uh, aspect of causality. Now, as far as lessening our karmic retribution, um, that's a very deep topic. Um, I'll just say very quickly that it could be compared to if you take salt and you put it, like take a cup of salt and pour it into a single glass of water, well, you're going to end up with a lot of <laughs> very salty drink. However, if you take that same cup of salt and you put it into a big pool, it's not going to have that much effect. So if, if you have a lot of good causes already made, you know, a little bit uh, that will mitigate the bad karma. On the other hand, um, if you have like a clean white shirt, you get a little spot on it, you're going to be really annoyed by that. Whereas if you're wearing like a dark shirt or a red shirt and you get a little catch up on it, it won't bother you so much. So the more you're trying to purify yourself and, and correct your habits, the more sensitive you're going to be, even though a lot of the, the bad effects of things that you've done badly are going to be mitigated if you're now doing good things. So you have to keep these two perspectives in balance, you know, the mitigation versus becoming more and more sensitive to not wanting to set up bad patterns. Okay, I think we should take uh, uh, back to you, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe in this this chapter, I don't quite have the memory skills to tell you exactly where it is, but they do talk about that, um, that even the Buddha had karmic, uh, a, a storehouse of karma from the past that had to be cleansed and, and given up. So it, it, it's a it's this process, the other to stick with the analogy of what Reverend McCormick is talking about. If you have this glass, and it's full of salty water, you know, you continue to pour water into it, uh, it will over time, the salt will lessen and lessen. As they say, uh, the secret to pollution is dilution. And our practice is the way that we dilute the pollution of our karma. 
Um, okay, so next is let's let's get into repentance. And here we have a kettle over uh, a fire with boiling water. And you can see the surface of the water is all is all troubled and turbulent. And you can't see the bottom of the pot because the surface of the water is all agitated from the hot fire. So let's discuss now as we go forward that there are two kinds of repentance. And repentance is the first step in cultivating a new life. Like the old expression says, the first step in changing anything is recognizing that there's a problem. Now, there are two kinds of repentance. Um, there's provisional repentance, which is repentance of the deeds we have done in this provisional phenomenal realm of, of dependent origination. And we do this through our ceremonial performance of the various praises and worship and chanting in our practice of chanting and shamatha and vipassana is how we do this. When we praise the Buddhas, we do that. This is this idea that unwholesome karma is produced by ignorance, avidya, of the three poisons of greed, anger, and delusions. And the light of wisdom, prajna, extinguishes them. As a Buddhist treatise says, the discriminative mind producing unwholesomeness is like clouds covering the sun, and the clear, wise mind is like the bright light dispelling the darkness. And then there's the ultimate perspective or ultimate repentance, which is this calm contemplation, shamat vipassana, into true reality, the three truths of emptiness, provisionality, and the middle way of the Buddha nature. So there's two repentances that we want to aspire to in our practice. One is the provisional, repenting for deeds that we have done in the past that perhaps has been causal to us feeling uncomfortable, unpleasant, and feeling suffering. And then the ultimate perspective, which is recognizing that there is a deeper cause for why we did these things in the first place, and we need to repent of both of them. If we persevere in our practice, doing our best to live a wholesome life by reflecting on our actions and taking accountability, over time, the unwholesome karma fades away, answering Stephen's question. Even the Buddha had karma that he had to expunge when Devadatta rolled the boulder down and broke his toe. Well, you know, Devadatta was again acting on the Buddha, but the Buddha had a little karma there too that he was still expunging. And as Michael says, you have a glass of salty water, you pour continuously pour fresh, pure water in over time, the water will become completely clear and, 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 and sweet and drinkable. So I wanted to also um, quote from the sutra. The sutra says, if you want to perform acknowledgement and remorse, you must sit correctly and contemplate ultimate reality. Let's parse that a little bit. So you want to have remorse you have to sit correctly, which we learned in the previous slide was kneeling with our palms together, eyes never leaving the, the, the Buddha, and this idea of contemplating ultimate reality. So when we're chanting Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, we're practicing Shamatha Vipassana, calming and contemplation. Goes on, all wrongs are just as frost and dew, so the sun of wisdom can melt them away. Therefore, with utmost sincerity, perform acknowledgement and remorse for the six sense faculties which have caused the suffering to arise. And acknowledgement and remorse is repentance, perform is practice. Sincerity, of course, is we have to be sincere about it. Now to repeat for emphasis, no amount of repentance for past provisional actions will work unless one also clears and quiets the mind through practice. As transgressions originate in our mind, they disappear when the mental functions and processes which cause transgressions quiet. Unwholesome karma continues accumulating as long as greed, anger, and delusions remain. This is like attempting to cool hot water boiling in a pot by adding a little bit of cold water, similar to the analogy of a salt glass, leaving the fire burning hot under the pot. Ultimate repentance is done by awakening to the true nature of reality, shoho jiso, thereby eliminating the defilements and delusions at their source, one's discriminative mind. To liberate ourselves once and for all, we should do both forms of repentance, provisional actions and false views. Our practice becomes like pouring huge amounts of cold water into the boiling water 
and extinguishing the burning fire underneath. So going back again to repentance. In the presence of Buddhas, you should now disclose your previous wrongs with utmost sincerity, acknowledge and express remorse for them. The Buddha addressed Ananda saying, to practice in this manner is called acknowledgement and remorse. This acknowledgement and remorse is the same method of acknowledgement and remorse practiced by the Buddhas and great Bodhisattvas in the 10 directions. So everybody does this in order to become enlightened. This is how we practice. This is the aspect of self power. We have to do the work. Now we bring in the aspect of humility, which is other power. Then the Buddhas and the 10 directions will extend their right hands, lay them on the heads of the practitioners and speak thus, good, my good children, good, you now read and recite the great vehicle sutras and therefore the Buddhas and the 10 directions will expound the method of acknowledgement and remorse. So now we get into other power, meaning that we have the humility to know that while we have to do the work on our own, there's no way we can do it by ourselves. which is why we get into the Sangha and the Dharma and the Buddha. We need these three things outside of ourselves in order to have the spiritual strength and the wisdom and the great spiritual merit to be able to really fully look at ourselves and not criticize or judge ourselves for our failings, but to be there and to look at them honestly, clearly and deeply and hold them like a mother holds a crying baby, not to eliminate them. We start with where we are, but to hold them in awareness and that light of awareness, that sun will melt them like dew in the morning grass. So now we get into the tenfold practice. Now we're five minutes over. I want to pause where we've got Oh, I don't know, six or seven slides left. Uh, and I see a lot of chat bubbles. Reverend McCormick, are there questions that we want to take a moment to ask? And then should we keep going or maybe just have part two next week? I think we should just keep going. Um, okay, any questions? Five sides left. Um, Josh asks, um, how should we think about the criteria by which we assess our past deeds to determine the focus of our remorse and repentance? I'd imagine that conscience is a partial or primary, I would say primary, guide, and the need to do no harm, which in itself is somewhat subjective. But what else? <clears throat> Nietzsche and Buddhism may be, may be places less emphasis on particular precepts, so it feels potentially tricky. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Um, Nietzsche yes. does, in brief, talk about um, the five precepts uh, to not kill, not steal, uh, not commit sexual misconduct, not lie, not to indulge in intoxicants as um, if you refrain from those, that's the kind of karma that leads to rebirth in the human realm, right? So by itself, that will not get you enlightened, but at least you will be in the human realm and not falling lower. Then there's the 10 courses of wholesome conduct or the so-called 10 good deeds um, that will lead to the heavenly realms, right? Um, so these are, in brief, abstain from killing, abstain from taking what is not given, abstain from sexual misconduct, abstain from lying, abstain from malicious speech, abstain from harsh speech, abstain from idle chatter, abstain from covetousness or greed, abstain from ill will, which is hatred or, or anger, and abstain from wrong views. Uh, this, by the way, is just an ethical breakdown of the Eightfold Path. Um, by themselves, without that insight that Yugan talked about in the previous slide, you can only get into the human or heavenly realms, right? But if you're not doing these things, you're creating the karma for the lower realms among the six realms. So this is basically the Buddhist ethical criteria right there. And then you just add to that the motivation to um, work compassionately for the liberation of all beings and to um, and to cut through all attachments, uh, which is indicative of the four noble realms or the four higher realms. And that's basically your ethical criteria right there. And um, and again, Nietzsche also refers to these five precepts and 10 courses of wholesome conduct. But um, he, he uh, makes it clear that by themselves, that only leads to the human and heavenly realms. But without them, you will fall to the lower realms, which makes it even more unlikely that you will get into the four noble realms. But the Daimoku, he says, will pull you up through all that, right? The Daimoku itself is a form of repentance that helps you to turn 
things around and turn your attitudes around so that you're no longer indulging in that kind of thinking and attitudes and conduct. Uh, and that's it. And then uh, Stephen asked, is this partly a link to Esho Funi? Well, yes. Um, of course, our, our, um, our causality merges with those other four forms of causality, and then that creates the world that we live in as we experience it. Um, and that's Esho Funi right there. You know, there's, there is a continuity between our uh, thinking and our conduct and our environment. And of course, between all of us together, creating a common environment. Okay, back to you. Wow, awesome questions. Um, I'd like to just stick with this idea of the precepts. Um, and as neat, you know, this is one of the areas that I think Nietzsche and Buddhism um, dangerously gets wrong. Um, as Reverend McCormick said, we as Nietzsche and Buddhists don't practice the precepts to become awakened um, because A, that creates a duality in between us and awakening. And that even just by practicing the precepts, all we're really doing is guaranteeing better circumstances in the human realm. So to become really awakened, we have to go deeper than that. Uh, Dogen also felt the same way. Um, he flipped it as to, instead of not killing, non-killing. And where he supported, I think, Nietzsche's view is that our primary precept is upholding the Daimoku, because when we're practicing, we're not committing any of the five precepts, because we're sitting, palms together, gaze on the eternal Buddha, chanting, so we're not hurting anybody, we're not stealing anything, yeah. we're not doing any intoxicants, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So our simple practice of chanting, in fact, is doing all five precepts at once. But what happens then is that the five precepts naturally arise as expressions of our practice. So as I've said several times in previous lectures, our following the precepts is not the cause for enlightenment. Our following or being examples of the precepts is the cause, is the effect, the actual proof of our practice. Mm -hmm. We spoke earlier today about Samantabhadra being a behavior role model, not an actual being. Samantabhadra's practice in this sutra is described as a tenfold practice. In other Mahayana traditions, at times, this has been five or seven or even 12. The number of steps is really not important. And as Tian Tai said, it's kind of arbitrary, but it's a good model. Um, and we're going to be looking at this in this context of self power and other power. So as we go through, and I'll start to speed up a little bit. This is the last long slide, by the way. Um, there were the 10 steps that are contained within this sutra are paying homage to the Buddhas, praising the Buddhas, making offerings, donations, dana, repenting from our transgressions, rejoicing in others' merits, requesting the Buddhas to teach, requesting that they remain in the world, following the teaching, complying and accommodating the needs of sentient beings, skillful means, and then transferring all this merit. Now, merit is spiritual energy to the sentient beings for their benefit. So we begin by offering respect to all Buddhas by bowing. And bowing is not subservience or petitioning for a higher power to intervene externally. Our bowing is showing respect, bodhisattva never disparaging, for the process of Buddhahood, acknowledging that we are all Buddhas to be with the capacity to become enlightened. Recognizing that we have the capacity to love, accept, feel joy, and bring joy to others. By acknowledging the Buddha, we acknowledge the Buddha nature inherent within us. This practice can help release us from this negative self-image that keeps you from realizing your true nature. Again, the parable of the wealthy man, the poor son, you're the only one holding yourself back because you think you're not worthy, but that's just nonsense because Bodhisattva never disparage says, hey, everybody is Buddha becoming a Buddha. This practice then develops our self-confidence so that we have wisdom, power, fearlessness, and insight to progress on the path. We understand and practice in this way. Paying respect to the Buddha is not merely a devotional ritual. It's also a wisdom practice in and of itself. Looking at this practice of bowing from the outside, 
we might get the impression that it is simple devotional ritual or that it's like praying to God. This is not true. While it is an expression of our respect and admiration for the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, notice the plural in all of this, bowing is not merely a practice of devotion. Breathing mindfully and bowing down to touch the earth, we are in deep connection with the Bodhisattvas and with the qualities they represent. Done in this spirit, bowing is actually a practice of meditation and repentance. We get in touch with understanding, compassion, action, and we see all living beings as the object of our awareness and love, which is why the Gohonzon that we look at has all 10 worlds on it. So in showing respect to these great Bodhisattvas, we are also demonstrating our commitment to practice the Bodhisattva path and cultivate the energy of understanding, love, and compassion within ourselves. That's merit. When we praise the Buddha's great understanding and wisdom, we touch those same virtues within ourselves as seeds in our storehouse consciousness. And then the Buddha's wisdom, virtue, merit practices are naturally transferred to us. Chanting in praise of the Buddha and the Tathagatas is not just devotion. It is a practice of wisdom and energy. Chanting is not the same as praying in supplication. We're not beseeching a higher power to give something to us. We're performing a practice that helps us touch the wholesome seeds within ourselves. Chanting is a wonderful and powerful practice to nurture and cultivate our wholesome seeds so they strengthen and grow. Our practice is both self-power and other power. The Lotus Sutra is the perfect balance of self and other power. It is self-power because we have to do it. It is other power because we need to trust and confidence in the process, flow, nature of the eternal Buddha, that we are part of the whole and subject to the intricacies of dependent origination. Regarding the ninth practice, always comply and accommodate the needs of sentient beings. Please be mindful of your own situation and not impose your point of view, feelings, and expectations on others. Try your best not to judge yourself or others. As best you can, be a role model for people, Bodhisattva never disparaging, and meet them where they are with skillful means to help them find their own practice and way. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to be connected. They want to be a part of something. They want to be free of suffering. And it's hard enough to change yourself, let alone another. You can't change someone else. You can be a light unto the world, but they have to do the work themselves, just as you have to do the work yourself. Show them the way by your actions, lead by your actions, and don't force anything on anyone else. So how do these 10 stages, practices, equal our nature and shoe service that we do every day, that we did this morning? Well. We start with the place of awakening, revering the three treasures, the invocation, and so on and so on, until finally we transfer all this merit to the world around us. And you can see how our service is based on the tenfold practice. And every single Mahayana form of Buddhism, again, is either five, seven, or ten, or twelve. They all follow this mode model of the tenfold practice from this sutra. So again, we see, wow, the Lotus Sutra has everything in it. So actual proof. Universal good will put their minds at ease. Hearing the profound teaching will comprehend its meaning and hold it in their memory without forgetting it. As they do this day after day, their minds will gradually become sharper. Universal good will teach the practitioners to recall and remember the Buddhas in the 10 directions. Again, plural, everything is a Buddha, yui butsu yo butsu. By following the teaching of universal good, the practitioners will become correct in mind and thought. They will gradually come to see in their mind's eye a Buddha in the Eastern Quarter, whose golden body is majestically aligned and dignified. Having seen one Buddha, they will see another Buddha, and so on and so forth, gradually seeing all the Buddhas everywhere in the Eastern Quarter. Because their mental faculties have become sharper, they will see all the Buddhas everywhere in the Ten Directions. Seeing everyone and everything as a Buddha, seeing everything as interconnected, interdependent, seeing everything as an expression of the process flow nature of Yui Butsu Yobutsu, the true nature of reality. The Buddha promises us healing and transformation will happen. Have faith and trust and confidence in that other power of the process flow 
not a being, but a process. This is what we're talking about in Namu, Myoho Renge Kyo. Another sutra, the uh, Samyara Nikaya connected discourses. <clears throat> One of the first techniques that we learn in meditation, and I spend a ton of time teaching this in my basic meditation classes, is finding the balance between effort and ease. Now, I encourage you to think about this very, very importantly and apply it no matter whether you've been a practitioner for 55 years or a year or a day. Please be kind and compassionate with yourself to find the balance between effort and ease. Balance in our chanting, our tone and our volume, our posture, our breathing and our awareness. This is the foundation for developing our equanimity, becoming a lifelong resource for our lives. So the Buddha tells us, he's being asked a question by this visiting God, how dear sir, did you cross the flood? The Buddha says, by not halting friend, and by not straining, I crossed the flood. The demon, the, the God says, but how is it that by not halting and by not straining, you cross the flood? The Buddha says, when I came to a standstill friend, I sank. When I struggled, then I was swept away. In this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, I crossed the flood. This is the meditation instruction so clearly to find the ease between the balance between effort and ease in your practice of chanting. And as we teach, when you feel like you're sinking, you focus on your nose. And if you feel like you're you're being swept away, you focus on your belly. Equanimity, what is equanimity? It's not tranquility. Equanimity is being calm when one is uncomfortable. Our practice of repentance is the same. Not too much, not too little. Be like Goldilocks. A bit of reflection and remorse with a bit of humility that we can't do it all on our own. We need each other. We need the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. We need this perfect balance between effort and ease, between self power and other power. What does this sutra mean to us? First, become your true self. Be like Samantabhadra. Practice. Without practice, there is no awakening. Find that perfect balance between effort and ease and knowing that this is a practice. It's not a perfect and you will explore this balance between effort and ease the rest of your life. I promise you, you will always be looking at this. Embrace it. Accept yourself right now. Good qualities and bad qualities. There is a gap between the actual and the ideal, but that gap is the ideal in and of itself. Accept it. Take responsibility for your actions. Some of the things some of your sufferings do come from misinterpretation of the eternal reality, true life, which is observing that you're part of the whole. Have trust and confidence in this process flow. Words, so we're, we're just about done. And I want to close with, I think, the perfect way to sum up the last 33 months. Genkai eren bo ni sho katsu go shin shu jo ki shin buku shichi jiki in yu nan yi shin yoko ken butsu fuji shaka shin yo jiga gyu shu so ku shutu ryo ju sen ga ji go shu jo jo zai shi pu metsu all who cherish and long for me look up with thirsting heart at last when living beings humbly believe are upright in character and gentle and flexible in mind and wish with all their hearts to see the Buddha even at the cost of their lives. 
Then I and the Sangha appear together on Divine Eagle Peak. At that time I tell all living beings that I am always here and do not pass away. Yi se shu jo ho Mai ji sa ze nen Yi ga ryo shu jo toko nyu mu jo ro So go jo ju bu shin to liberate each of them accordingly, I am ever thinking, how can I cause living beings to embark upon the unsurpassable way and quickly accomplish embodiment as Buddha? Everything that we have heard, read, seen, discussed, felt in the last 33 months, it's all in the container of Myo Ho Ren Ge Kyo. And I hope that the last 33 months has been fun, illuminating, helpful, and encouraging, and that you all do find your practice a stable place from which to create your own sanctuary and your own solace. Amu myo ho ren ge kyo. Thank you.